Good to see you. It's promotion weekend around WOC, which means, yeah, from kindergarten through sixth graders, everybody gets their new classes this weekend. So there's separation anxiety from where did my old teacher go? It was not the rapture, they're in another room. <laughs> Parents find the new classrooms. We get to begin a new school year together. What an honor. Amen. How many of you have children K through six somewhere in the house? Why don't you stand? We're going to look at this. That's you. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to pray for them. Just hang on right there for just a second. Um, if you've got children K through six, we want to pray for you. Stand up. <laughs> if you're not sure, ask somebody near you. They can help you sort it out. <laughs> we live in an age of great confusion. So, now a big deal. School starting. Lots of new challenges and costs and stuff. So, Father, I thank you for these parents. I thank you for their families and the children you have entrusted to them. I pray for the school year ahead, Lord, that it will be a year of. Not only where they learn, but where you're, you will see to their character. I thank you for their lives. Lord, we bless these parents. Give them wisdom beyond themselves. Meet every need that they have. I pray that it will be a year of peace in their homes, a year where Jesus is made more real than he's ever been before. We thank you for their lives and what you have entrusted to them. We bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. For our offertory prayer, we're going to pray for children in general, schools starting across our community and across our nation, and that's a lift. I think we're more awake to the importance of the schools than we've been in a while, huh? Amen. We've been a little distracted and turned our attention to other places, and we realized that they had initiated some things in schools that were um, a surprise. If there was a gift to COVID, we got to watch over the shoulders of our kids on the screens. And one of the, the responses was, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have begun to take faith back into our public schools. It belongs there. It's not wrong. It's not a violation of something. They're going to teach the children to put their faith in something. They might as well learn to put their faith in God, huh? That will help them more later on. It's okay. So uh, with COVID, there were some changes came to church. Obviously, we were outside for a long time, and we stopped passing things around out of an abundance of caution. And one of the things that changed was the offering. We're going to make some more changes in that. I'll tell you about it later. But um, as a result of that, we, we began a corporate prayer at every service. We called it our offertory prayer, but it's really been a lesson in how we can stand together. Uh, corporate prayers of God's people are important. Uh, you've learned new ways to give. I thank you for that. Many of you give digitally through the websites or the apps. Uh, we have offering boxes outside of every sanctuary for those of you that still do that tangibly. But I thank you for your generosity. Uh, we don't really give to the church or give to a budget. We give to the Lord. Uh, it's His, and I thank you for that. But that prayer time each week has become a very significant part of every one of our services. And this morning, I would like to ask you to join me in praying for the children. Uh, they need our prayers. They need us to lead with courage around our faith so that what they inherit has with it that essence of faith. Every generation has to make a ch the choice for themselves. And our children will have to make that choice for themselves. But it will be a much easier choice if we have stood on behalf of our faith and we have been willing to acknowledge that in the schools, on our college campuses, in the marketplace. If we fail, the cost for them to stand will be much, much greater. As much as I believe the debt we are accumulating is an abomination, I believe to abandon our schools and college campuses and turn them over to the secularist is a far greater misdeed to the generations coming behind us. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me for that prayer, wherever you're watching from, whichever sanctuary on campus, or if you're watching from someplace else. If you're off campus, I always ask you to put your food down. <laughs> Somebody came to me recently and said I hadn't mentioned quiche. <laughs> wow. We, 
we're becoming more sophisticated. <laughs> I used to think it was a bowl of frosted flakes, so I appreciate all that upward stuff, but uh, your prayers make a difference. And I hope you'll cultivate the habit of taking through the week as a matter of your daily devotional, whatever the theme of our corporate prayer is on the weekend. Together, we'll make a difference because I believe God listens to the prayers of his people. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the children. I thank you for their lives and the many blessings that are available to them. Lord, we have schools and health care and opportunities, Lord, their lives are filled with so much, and it's a gift from you. We thank you for that. I thank you for their parents. Lord, I pray they would have an awakening to your reality beyond anything they've ever known, beyond attending church, beyond identifying with their religion, that they would have a revelation of a living Jesus. And Lord, we want to invite you back into our, our schools. Lord, back into the elementary schools and the, the, the schools for the children, the daycares, into our college campuses and our high schools. Lord, I pray, I thank you that you'll give us administrators who fear your name, who will stand for righteousness and godliness and holiness. I thank you for the school boards across our nation that they'll once again be filled with people who have a faith in a living God. Lord, we've been distracted and we've been busy with many things and, and we come today to repent. But as you've begun to awaken us, Lord, may we have the courage to take our place once again, to stand for what's right, to stand against ungodliness and wickedness and immorality and perversion. We praise you for it. I thank you for the awakening you've begun. And Lord, we offer ourselves today. May it begin in our hearts. May it be continued in our spheres of influence. Lord, we need your help, and we cry out to you for mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. A couple of really quick things. Dr. Raleigh Washington was with us a few weeks ago. Remember Dr. Washington? He was the president of Promise Keepers. Just a, a wonderful man, a gift to the body of Christ in our country. But the weekend he was here, he had a new book that hadn't been released from the publisher, and he gave you a QR code where you could register for the book. Well, the publisher's website didn't work. I want to give you their address, but that's probably not a godly thing to do. And so many of you had tried to get a copy of that book, and there was some trouble around that. So we simply got uh, some copies of the book, and it's on campus in the bookstore. It's called One Word. So if you tried to get that with your QR code and the computer did not cooperate with you, it's never happened to me <laughs> this morning since 9.30. <laughs> but if you'd like a copy of that book, it is in the next chapter, and you're welcome to that. I, I believe it'll be a blessing to you. Okay, we're going to show you a little bit of video. Uh, it's about an hour and a half long. <laughs> no. Uh, we've been doing lessons from Peter. And I remembered an interview we did a while back. Uh, a few years ago, they had a historic drought in Israel. And at the time, the Sea of Galilee was the national water reservoir. So the level of water in the Sea of Galilee was critical, and it was at an historic low. Well, there were two brothers who'd grown up on the Sea of Galilee. They were fishermen, second-generation fishermen. And while the, the shoreline had receded more than they'd ever seen it recede before, they're on the shore one day and they see something of interest and they start to, to, to pay more attention and they find a boat buried in the mud. And they bring in the archeologist and it was a boat that was 2,000 years old. Right there on the same part of the, 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 the lake where Peter and his crew would have fished. So they found a fishing boat from the days of Peter. That's pretty cool now. 2,000-year-old wooden boats don't just hang around very many places. And so if you ever wondered what the, the boat might have looked like or the size of the boat that, that Peter and his crew would have fished in when Jesus said, you know, put out into the water and let your nets down on the other side, or when they're in the boat and they thought they were going to drown, you can see it. And we did an interview with the man. And I always thought the day I was talking to him, I thought, you know, you look like the great, 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 great grandson of Pete. I, I, you know, we don't have a lot of pictures of Peter. Most of them got lost. <laughs> but if you, if you want just an imagination what Peter might have looked like when he wrote First and Second Peter. Now, when Jesus recruited him, he's a teenager. Well, this guy's not a teenager. But by the time he wrote First and Second Peter, he had some life experience. 
So it's a fun, but they, they subtitled it because although the man knows English, he speaks Hebrew in every language. <laughs> so the subtitles will help, but we're going to go to Israel with no jet lag. Now that's a pretty good deal. And you can see a 2,000 year old fishing boat from the days of Jesus. My brother and I, we are born in Kibbutz Ginosar. And Kibbutz Ginosar is very, very near from the lake, from Sea of Galilee. My father is a fisherman. We are second generation for fishermen. So all the time we are a child, we are playing the water. Sea of Galilee for us is, you know, like a playground. Everything I learn in the water. We are not go out in the water. But all the time we are a child, we are dreaming. Maybe one day we are find treasure in the lake, but not gold. Something very, very old, uh, Abraham time, something like this. So I grow up, my hobby archeologic. I take my little brother Moshele with me, he's not so little, but. And uh, we are looking all the area, and suddenly three years, no raining, the level going, we are feeling this is a chance now, we are find what we are dreaming, we are not stop dreaming. And one day near from Magdala in Kibbutz Ginosar, we are find nail, after 20 centimeters, another one, Roman nail, and another one, we are clean the place, we see the wood and said, wow, we are fine, boy. we are jumping, we are dancing, we are crazy. Two weeks we are not talk from nobody because we are fine treasure. It belongs to us. <laughs> what we are bringing. But after we are called the archaeologic and archaeology come the moment we are archaeologic clean pieces and say she is very old, the weather change. It's very strong rain starting, stop quickly. Sun go outside is big rainbow go outside. Yes, she's so strong, she's double, not one, two rainbow. I feeling she belong from somebody, give it to us chance to uh, look at her, something like this. And after many miracles, she's here now. My brother Moshe and I, we are calling peace boat because we are feeling she changed all the area from something good. You see people like you coming, Hey, peace boat. Everybody come. I agree. Well, thank and you for sharing the story. You. Yeah? And uh, it's very, I'm very happy if more people come from uh, Museum Betalone and see this boat. I, just, I thought it was appropriate while we were working through these lessons from Peter that we meet his cousin. Yeah. <laughs> ah. And you can see one of the boats that Pete worked out of. We didn't find his driver's license in the bottom of the boat or anything, but it is a reasonable imagination that the boats described in the New Testament would have been similar in size to what you just got to see, which is quite a treat. Amen. I always smile at the way God has a way of sharing information with us. You know, 1948. Um, critical race theory is a big deal right now, but that whole deal of, 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 of critical theory and academics had been flourishing long before it got to critical race theory. And the, the first arena where it brought great destruction was in biblical studies. And they brought that critical theory to biblical studies in deconstructing the Bible. And the whole point was to say it wasn't trustworthy. And of all the books in the Bible, the one that seemed to, to draw the most criticism was the book of Isaiah, and the scholars just hated it. I mean, it was, a, it was a broad collection of biblical scholars across all lines. And they said there was no Isaiah, that there was a school of maybe of Isaiah's, you know, it was a way of thinking, but no one person did that. And that the oldest copy we had of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was from about 1000 A.D. They had to be hand copied, so there, obviously there weren't very many. And we had one copy of this, and 
They said it was corrupted because Christianity by 300 AD was the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so Christians had inserted text into it like Isaiah 53 and yada, 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 yada. Same objectives we see today, bring division and hatred and distrust and to pit us against one another. So biblical scholarship had, had suffered a great deal in the authority of Scripture. If you believed the Bible was authoritative, you were ignoring the science. Gee, that's something we've never heard before. Well, in 1948, a shepherd boy looking for a sheep, there's a bit of, the, 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 the scroll is true, exactly the details, but the story's told that a shepherd boy lost a sheep and he's looking for him and he throws a rock into a cave and he hears a jar break and he goes to explore. And he finds an old clay jar and inside it is a scroll. He doesn't know what it is, but he takes it to Bethlehem and it finds its way to someone who recognizes it. Coincidentally, it's the book of Isaiah. Now, it gets better. It's a thousand years older than any copy we had. And just in case you were curious, it was almost letter for letter identical for the one we had. So it predated the Christians. Isaiah 53, it just comes to be, was actually there before Jesus. Who knew? You could trust the Scripture. So I have to smile when they find a fishing boat on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee where Peter and his crew would have fished, buried in the mud. And now we just happen to have a little bit of a drought and the lake recedes and one of the young men that grew up fishing in the lake finds a nail from a Roman era boat. God has to have a sense of humor. And we're the slow group because we keep doubting him. Well, our topic is lessons from Peter. I want to continue it. You should have received an outline when you came in. It'll help. Some of you looked ahead. You already told me there's not as many scriptures as usual. They said that last night, but it did not shorten the sermon a bit. So don't be overcome with hope. My goal is to get you to the restaurant after the Baptists. Not really. I have invited you for the past several weeks to pay attention to the weekly releases from the Theater of the Absurd, because what is happening around us really defies description. It certainly defies logic. And every week there are new statements made or new decisions produced that have nothing to do with logic. They have a great deal to do with manipulation and control. But I, I really, f I want to take a little different tack, at least for a few sessions. You know, the, the darkness around us is only possible because of a couple of things. Darkness does not have the power to overwhelm the light. That defies physics. The only way for darkness to intensify, it requires one of two things to happen. The, the light has to be removed or diminished. And it seems to me that we have been in the midst of the circumstances for so long that we have lost sight of what normal might be. We've accepted the recalibration so many times that it's the proverbial frog, frog in the kettle. We are so far distanced now from what godliness and holiness and righteousness might be that when we bump into it, it feels awkward. And when somebody says it's inappropriate, we go, well, that must be true. Simple things like the Bible, you know, we, we've accepted the idea that it shouldn't be a part of our public lives. It shouldn't be a part of our public schools. It shouldn't be a part of our, our government. That's not been the course through our history. You know, during the American Revolution, the, the founders paid for Bibles to be published and be distributed to the people because they understood that the moral fabric of the people was necessary for us to be free and independent people. We have come a long, long way from that. The Bible for the majority of our history has been part and parcel of public education, long before we needed SROs. And, and we're so far removed from that, I don't even think we believe it anymore. So I'm going to share some, some little snapshots of points in time from our own story, just to remind you so that maybe we will gain the courage to become men and women of faith and hand to our children something beyond technological improvements. And I, I want to, since I mentioned the founders, I'm going to start there. Most of us have learned in school that the founding fathers in that generation of people were a bunch of greedy, racist, hate-filled, self-absorbed, narcissistic nation builders. 
And we've been taught to despise them, to hold them in contempt, to look for the worst parts of their lives and the weakest parts of their character. I would remind you that none of us would survive that kind of an analysis. But I want to bring you a bit of a different perspective. And I'll start with a conversation between Benjamin Rush. He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. When he reminisced with a fellow signer, John Adams, about what had occurred on the day they had signed the Declaration. And the very real reality that they were aware of that they might all be hanged for what they were doing. In the midst of that little conversation, Russ reminded Adams that Leviticus 25.10 is engraved on the Liberty Bell. Did you know that? You see, the degree to which Scripture is a part of our story as a people in an emerging nation has been very carefully deconstructed and hidden from us. That's wrong. Leviticus 25, if you don't know, says, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. But this was their conversation. He said, do you re recollect the, the pensive, the, the deep and somber silence which pervaded the house when we were called up, one after another, to the table of the President of the Congress to sign our names to what was believed by many at that time to be our death warrants? The silence and the gloom of the morning was interrupted. I remember only for a moment by a colonial, by Colonel Harrison of Virginia. He was a very strong, a large man. And he said to Mr. Gary, who was a very small man standing at the table, I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gary, when we are all hung for what we are now doing. For the size and weight of my body, I'll die in just a few moments. But from the lightness of your body, you'll dance in the air for an hour or two before you're dead. <laughs> he said the speech procur procured a temporary smile, but it was soon succeeded by the seriousness with which the whole business was conducted. While this comment temporarily lightened the somber mood of the day, they all understood that because of what they had done, death was a very real likelihood for each of them. They clearly realized that as one historian noted, history was strewn with the bones and blood of freedom fighters. America would be fighting the mighty British Empire, which had the greatest military power on the earth. And these men faced the very real possibility of losing everything they had. And in some way, they all suffered for their decision. And I'm going to give you a quote from a historian, T.R. Fehrenbach. He wrote this, nine signers died of wounds or hardships during the Revolutionary War. These were signers of the Declaration of Independence. Five were captured or imprisoned, in some cases with brutal treatment. The wives, sons, and daughters of others were killed, jailed, mistreated, persecuted, or left penniless. One was driven from his wife's death deathbed and lost all of his children. The houses of 12 signers were burned to the ground. 17 lost everything they owned. Every signer was prescribed as a traitor. Everyone was hunted. Most were driven into flight. Most were at one time or another barred from their families or homes. Most were off offered immunity, freedom, rewards, their property, or the lives and release of loved ones to break their pledged word or to take the king's protection. Their fortunes were forfeited, but their honor was not. No signer defected or changed his stand throughout the darkest hours. Their honor, like the nation, remained intact. Now, those signers have largely been forgotten today along with the high price they paid for the liberty that we possess. As John Adams reminded the younger generation of his day, the sacrifice made by the founders should always be remembered and honored. Posterity, you'll never know how much it costs the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you'll make a good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. Every generation. Every generation has to make a decision regarding freedom. We're no different. We can enjoy the freedoms that others have paid for, others that have sacrificed for. We can gobble them up like entitled children and stamp our petulant feet and demand more. Or we can make sacrifices to defend, to defend the things that we believe are valuable 
and the generation who follows us will benefit from those? I don't think the answer is clear yet because there should be no question we're engaged in a great struggle. And the future of our republic, but more than that, the future of our children and grandchildren is in the balance. Freedom does not come from governments. Liberty does not come from governments. There is nothing in the history of civilization that suggests groups of human beings will extend freedom and liberty to other people. Governments grow increasingly oppressive until they find themselves in some sort of a totalitarian expression that extinguishes all liberty. It's only the faith in a living God that has allowed this experiment to work. And I pray as the church, we will have the courage to turn up the light. An election won't do it. A political party won't do it. But a vibrant church comprised of men and women who believe that Jesus of Nazareth is Lord and Christ and who will yield themselves in obedience to him will see that freedom and liberty are extended. I pray we have the courage to be that kind of church. We've, been, we've spent a few sessions looking at some lessons from Peter. In this session, I want to talk a bit more specifically about true church and false church, but we're really going to look at the letter of 2 Peter. There's two letters in the New Testament that bear his name. They're written near the end of Peter's life. Great persecution is broken out in the Roman Empire. Rome burned. Many scholars believe Nero was at the heart of that, but Nero wasn't about to accept the blame, so he deflected it to the Christian community, and the, the greatest persecution that the Christians had known broke out against them. They became the, the sport in the arenas, from the Colosseum to the arenas around the empire, hunted by animals, set upon by dogs. Nero coated them in tar and bound them to poles, lit them afire, and illuminated his guarding parties with Christians. It was open season on Christians. Peter would be caught up in that persecution and die a martyr's death. But recognizing what was coming, he wrote first and second Peter to his friends, and he gives them some life coaching on how to flourish in the midst of the rising tide of hatred and animosity. I don't think it should be lost on us. Peter is recruited as a young man. When we meet him in the gospels, he's very likely a teenager, certainly a young man. And an itinerant rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, invites him to follow, and we follow him through the Gospels for three years. And Peter and the disciples are struggling mightily to keep up. They're often after, at the end of the day, we say, can you explain to us what you've been talking about? We have no clue. And Jesus will once again explain to them the meaning of what he's been saying. Peter and James and John were favored amongst the 12. They got unique opportunities. Jesus took them with him to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw him transformed. Well, he had a conversation with Moses and Elijah. Are you kidding me? Jesus took them with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, closer to where he was praying, and asked them to, to pray with him. They struggled to stay awake. From time to time, Jesus would look at them and say, are you really that slow? But when we get to the book of Acts, after the ascension of Jesus returning to heaven, it was Peter and his friends. Peter at the for forefront, the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, not the pope, but the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, that bumbling, clumsy, impetuous young man becomes a, a rock. Simon needs a reed. He went from being a person who was swayed by public opinion to being a rock. And he'd stand before the Sanhedrin that orchestrated Jesus' execution when they tell him, don't ever mention the name of Jesus again. And he said, we have to obey God, not you. Wow. Peter, that was always behind the curve, after the day of Pentecost, he was in the moment. He stood up after the Holy Spirit was poured out. He, he talked to the people in the streets of Jerusalem about Jesus, and he said, you crucified the Messiah. And he quotes from the prophet Joel and multiple passages from the book of Psalms, the fisherman. He's a transformed person. By the time he writes these two letters, He's seen many people reject Jesus, or people hesitate to follow, both individuals and groups. He's got a lifetime of experience now. He remembers the rich young ruler that came. They all liked him. They thought he was a hero. He was going to be a difference maker if they could get him on the team, a high-priced a high free agent. He's going to change our potential. 
But the young man thought it was the cost of affiliating with Jesus was too high, so he walked away. He remembered Judas. He lived with us, amongst us. He was one of us for three years, and he sold us out. He remembered Nicodemus. He was interested. He believed Jesus was a teacher from God, but he would only come when it was dark. He remembered the scribes and the Pharisees. Never mind the miracles, never mind the authority with which Jesus spoke. He was threatening their position and their power, and they'd rather have position and power, because if they had that, they could navigate life. They didn't need Jesus. He remembered the crowds in Jerusalem, the first ones that screamed, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. But then he remembered the crowds that cried out on the day of Pentecost, what do we have to do? Tell us what to do. And they baptized 3,000 that day. Peter knew Saul of Tarsus. Well, he knew the Apostle Paul, but long before he knew him as the Apostle Paul, he knew Saul of Tarsus. Peter was there that day when the widows came and said, we're not getting our food distribution. We don't like your leadership. The church is growing too fast. It was better before. Gee, we've never heard that before. Church is too big, Pete. And so the apostles got together and said, we need new systems. We've got to change. And they appointed some men to help care for the, the benevolence. And one of them was Stephen. Peter knows the story well. Stephen got pulled into the debate in the streets of Jerusalem, and the debate turned ugly. Imagine that, a public meeting going south. And Stephen is murdered in Jerusalem by an angry mob, and Saul of Tarsus is standing there cheering for the mob as they murder Stephen. That report comes to Peter. How do you think Peter? Peter. The one that said, Lord, if it's you, I'm going to walk on the water. Peter that said, these other guys may deny you, but I never will. How do you think that Peter felt about Saul of Tarsus? I'd like to lay hands on him. Stephen's death was personal. So when the message comes to Peter and the others in Jerusalem that Saul of Tarsus has had a Jesus encounter, you think trust might have been in short supply? He wants to meet with you. Yeah, we'd like to meet with him too. But we want to meet with him without any authority from the scribes or the Pharisees or the ruling council. By the time we get to 2 Peter, his life has been tempered by a lot of experience. I would submit to you he's a worthwhile coach. We're going to move through this really quickly. Really quickly. We're probably not going to move through all of that. <laughs> you know, they put a big clock right down here, like counting down. <laughs> I ignore it week after week after week, so don't be too encouraged. It's okay. That's not really true. The keeper of the children across the way will come for us. So. <laughs> But I simply took 2 Peter and have separated it into some topics. It's easier for me to, to maintain it, and I want to share it with you that way. We'll start with just some general travel tips. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. He goes on with his list, but it seems to me it's a very deliberate play on the promised land. Peter's personal heritage, the heritage of his people and of his whole faith journey was of God delivering them from slavery in Egypt and bringing them into a promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey, where they would live in cities that had walls they didn't build and they would reap from vineyards they didn't plant and olive groves that they didn't start. And now he's turning that to the non-Jewish world, and he said, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. 
And he's given us those through his very great and precious promises. We don't live in a promised land, but we lead lives that are filled with the promises of God. That's our inheritance. The, and he reminds us that the Israelites occupied the land, but they didn't make every effort. God said, drive out the people in the land. If you don't, they will lead you into idolatry, and ultimately you'll forfeit your inheritance. They didn't drive them out, and they lost their inheritance, and they were removed from the land. And so Peter makes a phrase that he's going to repeat. We'll see it before we finish this. He said in verse 5, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. God gives every person a measure of faith, but he said, make every effort to add to that. We looked in 1 Peter where he talked to us about growing up, desiring pure spiritual milk like hungry children. And now in 2 Peter, he's writing a follow-up letter, and he said, listen, there's pressures coming. You're going to have to make every effort. To be candid, when I think about Christianity, I don't think about making every effort. Come on. In fact, one of the great reluctances I had when I felt God inviting me towards ministry was I didn't think of church or Christians as being good at anything. I thought the buildings always smelled a little musty, and the people looked a little bored, and whenever we worked together to do something, the outcomes weren't something we were typically proud of. If we knew somebody that needed coach, we would say, you know, does anybody have a coach you don't want? Or if you got a new appliance, I remember people saying, well, I, I'm going to take my old appliance, I'm going to take my old refrigerator and give it to the church. <laughs> now, everybody's experience may not have been like that, but my imagination was church is where you went with your leftovers. If you didn't want it, if you didn't care about it, if it wasn't really essential to you anymore, maybe somebody else less fortunate than myself, so I'm just going to give God my leftovers. I didn't know my Bible well enough to that God had said, when you make an offering to me, you bring the very best you have. Don't bring me a lamb or a goat that has a defect. You bring the one that's the most valuable in the flock, and you offer it to me. I didn't understand that. So I was very—I thought, I don't want to give my life to something that's left over. You know, you go to church if you don't have a better option. He didn't get tickets to whatever was happening today, so yeah, I guess I could go to church. <laughs> and then I read Peter, near the end of his life. He's not a beginner. He's not a neophyte. He's, he's not unschooled. He's walked with the Lord a long time, and he's talking to his friends, and he said, make every effort. I want to start with that today. Make every effort in the context of your faith. Make every effort in your home to bring your faith to bear. Make every effort around your kitchen table that the people that occupy those seats know about who Jesus is and why that's important and what his values are. Make every effort in the marketplace that before they know you as a competent professional, whomever or whatever, that they know you as a person of faith. Make every effort in your peer group before you want to be approved or cheered for or included or whatever that might be, make every effort that they understand you will stand for godliness and righteousness, even if it means the forfeiture of a friendship or a relationship or an opportunity. Yes. Folks, we've, we've drifted a long way away from this. I read a story like that about those who signed the Declaration of Independence. We all sit up a little straighter and go, wow. We like to remember the story, but we're not sure we want to be those kind of people. We get bent out of shape if somebody sits in our spot, <laughs> if the parking is inconvenient, or they changed our children's classroom and I had to go find where they were. We're not really hiding your children. He wants you to take them. <laughs> Peter says, make every effort, because if you don't, there's a consequence. We've kind of lost any notion of consequences with God. We like to talk about a God of love and complete inclusivity and tolerance and grace and mercy. And I believe in those things. I really do. But they're only a portion of the character of God. God's not tolerant of sin. God's not inclusive of wickedness. He is not. And I don't want to lead you in an inappropriate direction. I'm afraid of the boss. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, Peter said, if you possess these qualities, the ones he's just listed, in increasing measure, 
They'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's an intriguing sentence to me. If something can keep me from being ineffective and unproductive, then there's a very real possibility that my faith could be ineffective and unproductive. We haven't even had that conversation. We talk in terms of whether we're born again or not. We don't talk of whether we're effective and fruitful. Remember, Jesus, Peter spent time with the Lord. He heard Jesus say, if you don't bear fruit, you're only good to be cut down and thrown into the fire. We've lost that conversation. He said, if anyone doesn't have these things, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you'll never fail. You'll never fall. You'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've somehow created a whole generation, churches populated with Christianity light. Just say the prayer, take a dip in a pool, and then get on with yourselves. Peter's inviting us towards a different imagination. Same chapter, chapter 1, look at verse 13. I think it's right to refresh your memory. As long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. He's not going glamping, folks. He's referring to his body as a temporary shelter. He understands that his death is very likely. I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. I'm writing you this letter so that after I'm dead, you'll have a reminder. Peter is providing us his personal counsel. He understands he's leaving this world. But if you'll read 2 Peter, you'll understand that he's very confident that his existence is not over. He's just changing addresses. We better live that way a little bit more. You see, when we compromise our faith because we think it gives us an advantage in the moment, we forfeit the privilege of our inheritance. I'm not always saying you're going to lose your standing with the Lord, but I am telling you, you'll lose your reward. We better live with a little greater awareness of eternity. What we're holding on to is a very brief part of our existence. There's something better for us. That's why we would be willing to stand up. It's why we would be willing to endure hardships. It's why we would be willing to make a sacrifice, to put ourselves at risk or our families at risk. The one thing that has become sacred above everything else in the current discussion is we wouldn't do anything that would bring hardship on our families. Now, I'm an advocate for protecting our families, but it's very clear that throughout the history of the church, men and women have made decisions that made it very difficult for their families. I think we're hiding behind them. Fellas. I think we've preferred a lifetime of adolescent choices. So we avoid the, the difficult decisions because we don't want to put anyone or anything else at risk. We act as if God is not there. That when we stand for him, we're not counting upon his deliverance and his protection and his provision and his faithfulness. Who's really in charge? Who is the strong tower that we're relying upon? If it's us, we're making our families incredibly vulnerable. Now, I believe in the authority in the home and the responsibility of fathers and husbands. But I don't imagine that we can replace the protection that comes from the Lord when fathers and husbands stand for truth and righteousness and godliness and integrity and dignity. If you're compromising those things, you have already made your families vulnerable. It's important. In verse 16, Peter says, we don't follow cleverly invented stories. We didn't follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses. Oh, by the way, he said, I was there. I'm not telling you what I learned in school. This isn't something that my dad passed along to me. I was there. I was the clumsy one that almost drowned in Galilee that day. I was the loud-spoken one that said I would never deny the Lord, and I hurried to the front of that line. He said, I was the one that when we got to the tomb and the body wasn't there, I looked at John and go, what do you suppose has happened? 
Everybody reading that story in the Gospels knows exactly what happened, because we read earlier where Jesus said, I'll be back. But the ones he told it to can't remember why, because the trauma of the moment was so high. The fear and the disappointment were so real that it's overridden the facts in their head. We all know what that feels like to get a diagnosis that unleashes a bolt of fear that, that causes facts to just evaporate. That's the same Peter, but he says, we were eyewitnesses to this. Look what he says, he, the Lord, received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. He's reminiscing about the Mount of Transfiguration, not the uh, resurrection. He said, we were on that mountain, John and James and me, and the light got really bright and intense, and Jesus was changed right before us. Moses showed up. He doesn't put it all. He said, it scared me out of my mind. He said, the best I could do was, I'll build something. I was in a Hebrew class at Hebrew University. It was an immersive class, which means there was no English from the very first day. The teacher never said, my name is. She held up a popsicle stick with a picture of Mickey Mouse and said, shmi Mickey. I thought, she has a speech problem. <laughs> I had signed up for a Hebrew class. I didn't, they didn't tell me it was an immersive class. I thought somebody was going to teach me. So, yeah, they were going to teach me something. They threw me in the pool and said, I wonder if you can swim. <laughs> I didn't even know the alphabet. First time they called on me to say something, I got so nervous, I stood up in Hebrew and said, I'm a pizza. <laughs> so I have a little bit of identification with Peter when he's scared out of his mind. He goes, let's build something. He said, I heard a voice from heaven say, this is my son. So I think a part of the reason we've been filled with so much equivocation that we think sitting in a church service is the grand expression of our faith. Or if we identify as Christian and not as Buddhist or Muslim, we imagine we've taken some bold, brazen declaration. We've planted a flag. Is it because we have such a small imagination of God? We've lost sight of the majesty of God. How did Peter describe it? God the Father, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son. We ourselves heard that voice. It came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Folks, we got to hear from God. We've got to decide what we believe. We've got to decide who we think is more powerful, the Federal Reserve or Almighty God. We have to decide who we think is going to secure our future in time and eternity. The denomination we prefer, the style of worship that makes us the most happy, are we really going to stand there and refuse to worship the Lord because I don't know that song? Let me make a suggestion. If you don't know the song, put your hands in the air and say, Lord, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving, both now and forevermore. I read something this week, really in preparing for the weekend, and it didn't make it into my notes, but since I've already blown my notes up. <laughs> at the end of the Gospel of Luke, there's a, the ascension is noted there. It's just the last three verses of the Gospel of Luke. Who wrote the book of Acts? Acts? It's a, it's a trick question. Luke wrote it. The, the Gospel that bears his name is the story of Jesus. The book of Acts tells the story of Jesus' friends after the ascension. So the first chapter of the, the book of Acts tells a larger version of the ascension. But if you conclude the Gospel of Luke, you can check me later. It's not in your notes, but it really is in the book. Luke tells of Jesus' ascension. It says they went with Jesus to the Mount of Olives to an area near Bethany. It's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. It's on the, the eastern side of the, the Mount of Olives. 
and that Jesus went back to heaven. And then there's a little sentence in there right after that. We're talking about worship is what triggered this. And that I won't worship if I don't like that style. Come on, this is all of us. Well, it says there that after Jesus ascended, there's one little sentence. It says they worshiped him. They worshiped him. Now, I spent quite a bit of time in Israel. I have a lot of Israeli friends. I can scarcely imagine a dozen Israeli men worshiping another Israeli man. Um, I can't hardly get that picture unless I have the gospel narrative to inform it. You with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine I said to you, you help me out for a minute? Stand up. Sorry, I'm not going to make you sing. <laughs> Just imagine I said, worship. Pfft. Not likely. <coughs> Looks like me, sounds like me, smells like me. No, nah, I may introduce myself, but I'm not worshiping. Thank you. Pray for him, that's stressful. <laughs> Luke says they worshiped him. Now remember by now they've been with him three years. They've seen the things that you know from the gospels. They've just walked through the resurrection. They spent 40 days getting a seminar on the kingdom of God. And they saw him go back to heaven. And by themselves, without, a, without any music, when he left them, their first response was to worship him, to give glory to him, to acknowledge that he is worthy of all honor and praise and majesty because he's not like us. He's one of us. You see, the amazing story, the, the, the heart of the Jesus story is the incarnation. God sent his son to become one of us. The authority over all all the universe today is the man, Jesus Christ. Peter said, I was on that mountain that day. I was still in the slow group, but he took me with James and John and we saw him transfigured. And God said, this is my son. I'm pleased with him. But I was terrified. And then Luke slips in right there at the end of his gospel. I've been thinking about it all week. They worshiped him. They worshiped him. We're going to have to come back to a little bit of that. I'm not talking about some catchy song with a, a line that you like. Or the worship leader that suits your aesthetic profile of who's qualified to lead you. I'm not talking about I had a good week or a bad week. I'm talking about there's an authority so far beyond us that it can speak worlds into existence, Amen. that can defeat death, that can speak to the wind and the waves and they'll obey him, or the demons jump when he says jump, and that he has called you out of darkness and forgiven your sin so that you can participate in his kingdom. And then he said to you, go into all the world. And proclaim this good news. Tell anybody that will listen. They can receive that same invitation. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. I'll empower you with my spirit in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I'll never leave you nor forsake you if you'll go. And they go, well, I'm not going to worship. I don't know that song. <laughs> So here's my suggestion. Next time it happens, Lord, I just want to give you glory. I want to worship you because you are worthy of all honor and praise and thanksgiving. You've done so much for me. You have blessed me in my life. You called me out of darkness. You've forgiven my sin. You have delivered me from a, a, a place of futility and despair and hopelessness. There'll be a little voice go off in your head. People are looking at you. I hope they are. Come on. I hope they'll decide to play follow the leader. 
I hope the people next to me are listening and they're going to join in the chorus themselves. That voice will hush when it realizes you're not going to back up. We've been so easily intimidated. That little voice has been leading us around by the nose like a bull ring. It's time we start listening to the voice of God. And say, I will honor you and follow you and obey you. Peter told him the truth. He said, there's some really tough times coming. But he said, if you suffer for doing good, there's a reward for you. There's a reward for you. It's better than buying the winning lottery ticket because it won't perish or fade or be diminished. It can't spoil or be devalued. You want some of that reward. Folks, it's better than being a churched person or a religious person or a moralist. We need a little more courage in the church. I understand we live in a world where everybody doesn't love Jesus. I'm going to love him anyway. I understand that a biblical worldview isn't shared by all, but I don't believe there's a better way to live or I'd be living that way. So I'm going to invite people to what I know. It's the ultimate life hack. And if you're not telling your friends about it, you're not a good friend or you don't believe it works. It's time to make a choice. Peter's trying to help us. Aren't you glad I brought that short outline? Why don't you stand with me? They worshiped him. They worshiped him. I want us to close that way. Last night I gave him an invitation. We filled the aisles with people. I'll, we'll do that another time. I want to close by giving you an opportunity to worship the Lord. No musicians, no vocalists. Oh, because if I sing, the lights will go dim. <laughs> the best way I know to find victory when you have pre pressure points, problems, diagnosis, pain, hurt, all those things that come with life is to worship the Lord. At the darkest places in my life, the darkest times in my life, I would have just to begin by being thankful. I would take the aspects of God's character that I believed were true and I would thank him. God, I thank you that you're just. I don't see your justice right now, but I thank you that you're just. I thank you that you're a God of love. I thank you that you're a faithful God. There may be only two or three that I could get to my mind, and I would take those two or three and I would repeat them until that heaviness would leave me. I want to invite you to just for a moment to worship the Lord with me. It may be for you, it's just a thank you. Thank you, you have food to eat or transportation or a place where you can come worship. Folks, we've got to become the church again. We've got to turn the light up or we're going to hand something to our children and they will not rise up and call us blessed. Amen. Amen. Can you worship the Lord with them? I'm going to lift my hands. If that bothers you, close your eyes. <laughs> you can be a fanatic right along with me. It's okay. You go to a ball game. If you like the team, you'll do more than raise your hands. You just scream and shout and throw popcorn and pay $40 for a Coca-Cola. <laughs> Amen. Lord, we want to take a moment to say thank you. We want to bless your name. We want to give glory and honor and praise to you. For you are worthy of all. There is none like you. There is none your equivalent. There is none to compare with you. Almighty God, you created the earth and everything that's in it. We give you glory and praise and honor today. Lord Jesus, you came and walked amongst us. You gave us a revelation of the Father. We praise you for that today. We bless your name. We give you glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving for your obedience. You offered yourself as a sacrifice that we might be free. We praise you for it. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are at work in our midst, that you live within us to lead and guide and direct. You're our comforter, our strength. We praise you for it today. We thank you that greater is he who's for us than all those things arrayed against us. We praise you that you're our provider, our sustainer, you're our rock, our strong tower, our deliverer. You have declared us righteous through the blood of Jesus. We've been sanctified and justified, made holy, set apart to God. We praise your name today. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all you've done. May your name be exalted in our generation, in our schools, in our colleges, in our corporations, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our judicial buildings, in our hospitals. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. 
We praise you for it. Jesus is Lord over all creation. Jesus is Lord over all creation. We bless your name today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give the Lord a hand, huh? I forgot something. We got a book for you as you're leaving, if you would like. We have one for every family. It's a devotional, Lessons from Peter. We don't have one for every family you know. If the family that normally sits next to you didn't come to church, they can buy one next week, okay? But we'll give every family one this morning. God bless you.